Okay, so today we will study some uh, more number theoretic results, so which will be useful in our future studies of asymmetric cryptography. Okay, so so today we will discuss about two interesting and important algorithms. One is called Euclidean algorithm, which is used to compute the GCD or the greatest common divisor of two integers. And also, which is useful to compute the multiplicative inverse. So, we have defined what is a multiplicative inverse. So, we will see how the Euclidean algorithm can be extended to compute the multiplicative inverse. And then we will discuss about another very interesting algorithm, it is called Chinese remainder theorem. The theme is to express whole in parts. Okay. So, we will uh, see what is that. And then also conclude with some uh, in important results on cyclic groups and also discuss about a test of primitiveness of an element. So, previous results if you remember that what we did in the last time when we studied uh, about uh, number theory, we studied modular arithmetic. So, we have uh, more or less seen what is meant by modular arithmetic and the idea was that the so Zn star was used to denote the set of residues modulo n that are relatively prime to n. So, I hope you remember this notation. So, Zn star means that if n is any number given, so n is not necessarily a prime number. So, Z n star means all those elements, okay, when I am reducing uh, the element modulo n, so which those elements has to, I mean the residues has to be relatively prime. So, they have to be co prime to n, right. So, therefore, they should not have any factor with n except 1, okay. So, therefore, they are co prime to n and Z n and Z n star is used to denote that particular set. So, we have seen that Z n star forms a multiplicative group under multiplication. Okay. That means that Z n star essentially what we saw that every element has an inverse, right? Has a has a multiplicative inverse. So, any element inside Z n star has a multiplicative inverse, and Z n star is also closed under multiplication, multiplication. So, if you take two elements which is lies in Z n star and multiply them and also take a modulo n, then the result is also inside Z n star. So, that is a closure property right. So, today we will take up an, Euclid an algorithm which is called the Euclidean algorithm. So, I think all of us know this algorithm in actually. Okay. So, therefore, this is actually the same algorithm which we have used in our school days to compute GCD of two numbers. Okay. So, the thing is that uh, we will just study that little bit more carefully. Okay. So, let us see that suppose two numbers are provided to us A and B and we have suppose a greater than b okay so what do you do uh, typically what you do is like this that is you take a and you store a in a uh, variable called r not and you take b and store that in a variable called r1 okay then what you do is that you start dividing r not by r1 you obtain a quotient called q1 and here you get q1 r1 right so therefore r so the remainder which you get is called r1 i denote by r1 and r1 equal to r0 minus q1 r1 right so this is the remainder so you get r0 here and you subtract q1 r1 and you obtain uh, r2 okay so that is actually r2 so so that is so, therefore, if you see that uh, this I can actually continue, right. So, therefore, what I do is that next I take R1 here and I divide R1 and I continue with this process. So, therefore, at any stage that is at any mth stage, I have got this particular thing, I have got Rm minus 2, okay, and I divide that by say Rm minus 1 and I get here Qm minus 1, okay, and I get here Qm minus. Uh, 1 into R m minus 1 and this remainder is R m. Okay. So, R m is R m minus 2 minus Q m minus 1 R m minus 1. Okay. So, this is the corresponding result at the mth stage of this algorithm. right? So, therefore, now uh, we know that we continue this kind of division and when we get the remainder value to be equal to 0, then we look at the previous divisor value and report that as the GCD of these two numbers are not an R1, right. So, that is the fundamental working of the algorithm. So, I think all of us know this algorithm, right. So, why does this algorithm work? So, therefore, this is the 
pseudocode of the algorithm you see that see that r0 has been stored i mean a has been stored in r0 b has been stored in r1 and you start with m equal to 1 you compute the quotient so the quotient is the floor of when you divide rm minus 1 by rm okay so that is the uh, so this is the rm minus 1 divided by rm and you get qm okay and then you get, get rm plus 1 so rm plus 1 is rm minus 1 minus qm into rm so same thing you i mean in the particular equation that we wrote you can also write rm plus 1 equal to rm minus 1 minus qm rm right so therefore this particular step is written out here so rm plus 1 equal to rm minus 1 minus qm into rm and m equal to you increment m each 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 number i mean each times and when you get the value of remainder equal to 0 you see m equal to m minus 1 that is the previous stage and you report the corresponding rm as a of the previous I mean, which is the previous divisor as the corresponding GCT. Okay, so now wh what is the reason why this is correct? I mean, the correctness of this algorithm can be seen by this particular uh, equation set. That is, what I'm interested in computing is GCD of a comma b, right? So what is a? A is R naught and b is R one, right? So R naught is actually equal to Q one R one plus R two, right? And R one is R one. So therefore if I take a GCD of these two numbers because R1 is here and R1 is also here, this reduces to GCD of R1, R2, right. So therefore, in, if I continue in this fashion, I get GCD of R1, R2 equal to GCD of R2, R3 and similarly. And then finally, since Rm is dividing Rm minus 1, so therefore, the GCD is Rm, right. So therefore, this actually terminates, uh, the, this, uh, I mean this algorithm gives you also correctly the corresponding GCD of A and B. Right. So, therefore, the Euclidean algorithm can be used to compute the GCD of two positive integers and it is also can be used to check whether an integer modulo n has a multiplicative inverse. How can you do that? How can we check? So, what is the check? Whether a particular element, whether a particular integer modulo n has a multiplicative inverse. We have studied this property. What is the property? Yeah, GCD of a comma n is equal to 1. So, therefore, what I have to do is that I have to compute the GCD and the GCD has to be 1. If the GCD is 1, then the element has an integer, I mean has an inverse, multiplicative inverse, okay. But the question is how can I compute the inverse? That is the next question. So, therefore, I can check the whether an element or whether an integer modulo n has a multiplicative inverse very easily. But the thing is that I am also interested to compute the corresponding inverse value, okay. So, this particular algorithm is called the extended Euclidean algorithm, okay. So therefore, uh, let us study or let us try to compute the inverse of 28 modulo 75. Okay, so so therefore, if I am, uh, I mean, what I can start doing is that. So what I am trying to compute is 28 inverse modulo 75. Okay. So suppose I am first of all I am I should know that whether 28 inverse really exists or not, right? So therefore, what I will do is that. I will find out the GCD of 28 and 75, right. So, therefore, what is the corresponding GCD of 28 and 75, okay. So, therefore, ideally this, this should be 1 and I have to check this thing, right. So, 28 if I, I mean if I divide 75 by 28, I get here 56 and therefore, this is equal to 19, 1, 19, I get here 9. 19, 2, 18, and I get here 1 divide, I get here 0. So, therefore, 1 is my corresponding GCD, okay. So, the multiplicity inverse really exists, okay. So, therefore, now you can actually start expressing these things in this fashion. You can write like 75, so this 75 is equal to 2 into 28, 2 into 28 plus uh, 19, right. So, 2 into 28 plus 19, right. So, then what you can do is that you can see 28, 28 is 1 into 19 plus 9. Then you have got uh, 19, 19 is equal to 2 into 9 plus 1. And finally, you have got 9 equal to 1 into 9. Okay, so now the f uh, the interesting thing is that uh, 
you will see that each of these remainders that is whatever you are getting the, as a remainder can be expressed as a linear combination of the elements 28 and 75. Okay. See for example, 19 is equal to 75 minus 2 into 28. So, what about 9? 9 is actually 28 minus 1 into 19, okay. but I know how to express 9, uh, 19. right? So, I know that 19 is nothing but 1 into 75 minus 2 into 28. Okay. So, therefore, these I can collect and I can, I can write this as 3 into 28 minus 1 into 75. Right. So, what about the next element? The next remainder is 1. So, 1 is 19 minus 2 into 9. So, 19 I know as 3 into 28 minus 1 into 75. So, this is not point. Okay. So, 1 into. So, minus 2 into 9. So, what is 2 and what? Uh, so, therefore, what is 9? Okay. Oh, I think I wrote the wrong thing. Right. So, therefore, 19 is actually 75 minus 2 into 28 minus 2 into 9. So, 9 is 3 into 28 minus 1 into 75. Okay. So, um, so therefore, this is actually 75. So, therefore, this is actually 3 into 75 minus 3 to 6 minus 2, 8 into 28. Right. So, now you see that if you take this final uh, equation and I will write properly. So, this is what? This is 1 equal to 3 into 75 minus 8 into 28. Right. So, now suppose I take a modulo 75 on both sides. So, what do I get? I get 1 equal to minus 8 into 28 mod 75. Right. Because this term goes to 0 in that case. Right. So, now what is the multiplicative inverse of 28? It is minus 8 because if I multiply it with minus 8, I get back 1. Right. So, therefore, minus 8 mod 75 means 67. So, therefore, the multiplicative inverse of 28 mod 75 is equal to minus 8 and that is equal to 67. Right. So, therefore, why did it, why did the, I mean, why, what, what was the main objective? The main objective was that at each stage, the Euclidean algorithm, whatever remainder we were getting from the Euclidean algorithm, we were express, expressing that remainder as a linear combination of the starting two elements. That is the mod value, the, I mean, what you are doing modulo with and the element for which you are interested in computing the multiplicative inverse. Right. And that is the main working principle. So, therefore, the main question is that can you express the GCD as a linear combination of 28 and 75. So, after that it is quite easy because we know that GCD has to be 1. So, if I take a modulo with this corresponding 75, then whatever element I get on the right hand side, the product I mean the, the element which, which with which I am multiplying 28 to get back 1 is the multiplicative inverse of 28. Okay. So, this is what I did. So, we can actually, so therefore, the answer is actually minus 8 mod 20, 75 equal to 67. So, therefore, now we will generalize this, but so what is the lesson that we learn? That all the remainders which are generated by the Euclidean algorithm can be expressed as a linear combination of the positive integers a and b. Okay, and although I am not proving, but it is quite easy to prove that the expression is actually unique. So, therefore, you cannot find two such linear combinations which will actually satisfy this. Okay. So, this extended Euclidean algorithm actually generates or computes a linear combination in a very systematic fashion. So, that is the main objective. So, therefore, we will see that the extended algorithm it just generates or computes this linear combination values in a quite systematic fashion. Okay. So, so how do we do this? So, therefore, this is how it is done. So, you define a series of t terms, so t0 to tm and similarly from s0 to sm. And this is how you define Tj and you define Sj. So basically, you have a recursive construction. Okay. So you see that j equal to zero, Tj has been initialized to zero, and and if j equal to one, then Tj is equal to one. What about Sj? Sj is just the other way around. So if j equal to zero and then uh, then Sj is equal to one. If j equal to one, then Sj equal to zero. So this is just the opposite of this definition: zero, one, and one zero. 
Why? Because this Tj and Sj is actually used to is the corresponding. I mean, I am what am I what am I interested to do? I am interested to express the remainder as a linear combination of R0 and R1, right? So now this I mean the corresponding coefficient in that linear combination is being generated by the series Tj and the series Sj. Okay. So here the first remainder is if I start with say R0. Okay. So, so therefore, if I say that the 0 r, j equal to 0 r j r 0, so r 0 will be equal to 1 into r 0 plus 0 into r 1, right. So, therefore, therefore the starting point of this should be 1, right. And what about the, uh, so in the, when, it, when this is 1, this is actually 0. So, therefore, you see that when this is 1, this is 0, okay. So, when, when you are expressing r 1, then similarly r, this t j has to be 1 and s j has to be 0, right. So, therefore, S j is 0 when r j equal to 1, then S j equal to 0 and T j is equal to 1, okay. But the, for the rest of the j values, that is when j is greater than 1, that is j is greater than equal to 2, okay. So, in that case, in, in those scenarios, T j is defined like this and S j is also defined like this, okay. So, T j is what? T j minus 2 minus Q j minus 1, T j minus 1. So, Q j minus 1 is the same as that we got in the Euclidean algorithm and S j is equal to S j minus 2 minus Q j minus 1 into S j minus 1, okay. So, what we can actually prove is that R j which is the corresponding remainder value at the jth stage can be expressed as a linear combination of R 0 and R 1 with coefficients S j and T j, okay. So, the R j's are as defined in the Euclidean algorithm and the S j's and T j's are as defined in the above recurrence, okay. So, why does it work? So, we can see how why it works. So, for base cases like for j equal to 0 and j equal to 1, this is trivial, right? That is what we argue. So, let us assume that it is true for j equal to i minus 1 and j equal to i minus j equal to i minus 2 and j equal to i minus 1, okay? So, what we will prove is that it is also true for j equal to i minus 1, I mean j equal to i. So, this is basically mathematical induction. So, we are applying mathematical induction to prove this result, okay. So, what type of induction is this? Weak or strong? This is weak induction, okay. So, we apply j equal to i and uh, so, we, so, we know we expect the results for j equal to i minus 2 and j equal to i minus 1 and we are proving the result for j equal to i, okay. So, when we are assuming for j equal to i minus 2, therefore, that means that I can assume that r i minus 2 equal to s i minus 2 r 0 plus t i minus 2 r 1 and also r i minus 1 equal to s i minus 1 r 0 plus t i minus 1 into R 1. So, these are two given results, okay. So, what about, uh, so, so when we are, when I am computing R i, so that is R i is the corresponding remainder, then that means that what I have done in that particular step in the Euclidean algorithm is that I have taken R i minus 2 and I have divided that with R i minus 1, right. And what was my remainder here? It was Q i minus 1 and I have got Q i minus 1 r i minus 1 and my remainder was r i. So, what was r i? r i was r i minus 2 minus q i minus 1 r i minus 1, right. So, therefore, r i is equal to r i minus 2 minus q i minus 1 into r i minus 1, right. So, therefore, I can take this previous two given or assumed results and I can plug in them so, therefore, I get R i minus 2 as equal to S i minus 2 R 0 plus T i minus 2 R 1 minus Q i minus 1 and S i minus 1 R 0 plus T i minus 1 R 1, okay. So, that is equal to if I take S i R, R not out from this, therefore, if I take R, R not collect, uh, collect R not, I get S i minus 2 minus q i minus 1 s i minus 1 into r 0 plus t i minus 2 minus q i minus 1 into 
T i minus 1 into R 1. So, therefore, you see that this particular these two terms are nothing but what is S i and T i. So, therefore, I can write this as S i R naught plus T i R 1 and that proves the case for j equal to i. Right? So, that means that the remainder can be expressed as a linear combination of R naught and R 1 where the corresponding coefficients are S i and T i and S i and T i are defined by this particular recurrence. Okay? So, therefore, I can repeatedly I can keep on continuing this values, these coefficient values and then I should be able to express the remainder at each stage as a linear combination of R 0 and R 1. Right? So, <coughs> any doubts about this? So, therefore, this is now the pseudo code of the algorithm. So, it is quite simple actually if you just observe it minutely it is nothing. I mean there are uh, just it is uh, there are some temporary value variables which have been used it is just to save some vari variables, but it is same thing you see that T 0 minus Q T and S 0 minus Q S are the main things. So, therefore, you are basically computing the T series and the S series. Okay. So, and you are using that to compute the corresponding coefficient values. Okay. So, therefore, finally, what you are giving back by the extended Euclidean algorithm, when you are given two numbers, two positive numbers A and B, you are actually giving back the corresponding GCD of A and B and you are also expressing the remainder as a linear combination of A and B. So, you are giving back the coefficients S and T. Right? So, therefore, how can I use this uh, to compute the multiplicity inverse is quite clear. Right? Therefore, I have to just take a modulo on both sides and therefore, I should get the remainder. Right. I mean I should get the multiplicative inverse if it exists. Right. So, this is an example same example. So, therefore, uh, previously we were trying to compute we are taking two numbers 75 and 28 you plug in this to the extended Euclidean algorithm you get the Q i series and the I mean you get the these are the corresponding co uh, uh, quotients and this is the S i S series and this is the T series. So, therefore, you can use this particular recurrence to compute these values. So, you start with 1, 0 and 0, 1 and the subsequently you can uh, take these Q values and you can take these T, uh, previous T values because at this stage you know all the already the previous two stages. So, you can employ this recurrence to compute the values for S 2 and also for T 2 right? because you know the value of S 0 and you know the value of S 1 okay? and you also know the corresponding coefficient I mean the, the quotient value. Okay. So, therefore, you can so therefore, you can check this that this works as follows. Finally, what you obtain is this this thing that is you obtain that 1 which is the G C D is actually actually equal to 3 into 75 minus 8 into 28. Okay. So, therefore, taking modulo 75 28 inverse mod 75 is equal to minus 8. Right. So, therefore, you remember that this S i was actually getting multiplied with 75 right so therefore if i take mod 75 on both sides then actually this series the i mean we could have if we are really interested in computing only the inverse then computing this si series is actually of no use right because i am actually taking a modulo 75 on both sides right so therefore actually i can i mean i can make this algorithm more tailored for the multiple inverse computation by actually removing this si series because i don't require to compute this right do you all of you understand this that it is not required to compute this? Yes. So, this is an improvement. So, note that we do not require the SIs and can take a modulo 75 each time while computing the TIs. So, this will make the algorithm more efficient. So, therefore, I can actually do without computing this column and the answer which I will still get is minus 8. So, therefore, minus 8 mod 75 means 67, right. So, so therefore, this concludes our discussion on the Euclidean algorithm and then we will take another interesting algorithm it is called the Chinese remainder theorem. So, basically it is a it is a systematic algorithm which, comp which solves the system of congruences. Okay. So, originally people say that it was employed by the Chinese people. Okay. So, therefore, uh, the idea was that suppose they wanted to compute uh, find out how many people were there in their army. Okay. So, therefore, they used to say that okay, you stand in groups of 5 stand in groups of 3. So, in co prime orders and whatever is the remainder which is a small number in inside 5 and 3 they used to compute that and from there they used to find out how many people are there in the army okay, without counting 
okay that was the objective okay so therefore therefore the idea was that it solves a system of congruences and suppose m1 m2 and m so on as mr are pair wise relatively prime positive integers so the system of congruences is as follows you take x and you report only a1 which is when you take mod of m1 okay similarly you take mod of m2 you report a2 you take mod of mr you report ar okay so this a1 a2 and so on till ar are actually just the co i mean the values when you take modulo of x with m1 okay so therefore this number is definitely smaller than m1 similarly this number is smaller than m2 okay and similarly this number is smaller than mr so computing these values is actually easy in that case right because these are quite small numbers so therefore what you are seeing is that this i mean when you are solving this x value from this system of equations okay so what you are essentially trying to say is that you are expressing the whole as in parts okay so therefore the theme is like to express the whole in parts so you see that this algorithm has got lot of applications in cryptography and maybe many other places so the, the i mean for cryptography actually you will see that this this algorithm is naturally a secret sharing algorithm okay so what you are doing is that suppose there is a file and instead of giving disclosing the file and suppose there are r users okay so i am not giving everyone i mean i am not giving each one the entire file content okay so what i am doing is that i am dividing it among say r value r people okay so not i mean suppose i divide it among r people in this class the entire file content becomes evident only if these r people join right but not not when r minus 1 people join so therefore i can write this information theoretically also that means that if r people are joining then the information is total right but if r minus 1 people join then the information is actually zero okay so you don't have any information of the file but there is something which is called a threshold scheme this is not a threshold scheme which i have told you but this is definitely a secret sharing scheme okay so chinese remainder theorem has got so many applications actually okay so so let us try to understand how it works okay so first let us start with a small example so therefore suppose that x is actually 3 mod 5 and x is 1 mod 3 okay so what is the value of x when you take mod 15 okay so you can verify and the only answer is actually 13 mod 15 so therefore the only answer to this is 13 okay so the first thing to explain is why there is only one solution that is why is there only one unique solution okay so in order to understand that let us do one thing so let us define one function which is like this you take x which is the actual thing which you need to con compute and you express this as tuples like this like x mod 5 comma x mod 3 okay <coughs> so you you note that what are the possible values of x since you are considering x from mod mod 15 there are actually 15 values right from 0 to 14 <coughs> so for each of them what i am doing is that i am storing 0 mod 5 0 mod 3 for this case for example when when i mean when the x value is 0 then i am storing 0 mod 5 and 0 mod 3 when x is 1 i am storing 1 mod 5 and 1 mod 3 okay see for example when x is 10 i am storing 10 mod 5 which is 0 and 10 mod 3 which is 1 okay so similarly i can populate this table okay and the thing or the interesting thing to be noted is that this is actually a bijective mapping which means that you will never get two zero comma zeros in this on the right hand side okay so you see that the domain is actually that there are 15 values and in the range also there are 15 values right and there is actually a one to one connection so therefore it is definitely a bijective mapping okay so what we, so we first we will try so we will try to prove this but we will actually give you a constructive proof so that means we will give you a solution and also prove that it is unique so why are okay so another interesting thing i, I mean probably i missed it or uh, so you see that the m values are actually relatively prime okay so this will work with any m values which are relatively prime so it could have worked with but therefore you understand that it has to be a, i mean it has to be odds because otherwise they are not relatively prime if you take two even numbers then two is a common factor right so therefore this will work if you take two mutually mutually prime numbers okay so therefore you can take this as an even number and this as an odd number 
but you cannot take two even numbers. Okay. Right. So, so we will try to prove this. Okay. So, <coughs> so therefore, you see that we can do like this. That is, you take m. So, therefore, you take 5 and 3 and you multiply these two things. So, therefore, this is the modular value 5 and this is the modular value 3. You multiply them and obtain m 1 by dividing 15 by 5. So, when you take 15, you divide by the first modular value which is 5 and you get 3. Okay. And now, you see that 3 since you have taken 3 or rather factored out 3, 3 and 5 are mutually co-prime. Right? So, therefore, you can actually compute 3 inwards mod 5 and 3 inverse mod 5 is actually equal to 2. Okay. Similarly, m 2 also you can compute by dividing 15 by 3 and you get 5 and you can compute 5 inverse mod 3 which is also equal to 2. Okay. So, you see that x which is the actual thing which you are interested to compute will be equal to 3. So, 3 is this value that is uh, 3 is this value okay. and you take 3 and multiply it with 5 and multiply with the inverse value. So, therefore, you take 3, you multiply with uh, 3 and you multiply it with 2. Okay. Similarly, you take 1, you multiply it with 5 and multiply with 2. Okay. And if you take this, this works out to 28 and 28 mod 15 is actually equal to 13. So, what is the underlying principle? So, we will try to understand that first. Sir, okay. yeah. how did you get the second thing in this? Uh, Okay. So, let us do one thing. Okay. So, let us go ahead and read this uh, read the solution okay. and let us try to understand the principle and then we will go back to this example. Okay. So, maybe I, I could have placed this afterwards. Okay. So, let us present a constructive proof that is uh, in fact, this Chinese remainder theorem gives an explicit formula for computing x inverse mod m. Okay. So, where m is actually equal to the product of m 1 to m r and what I do is that for each step I compute m i where I divide m by small m i. Okay. So, what is the G C D of m i and big m i? It is of course, equal to 1 because you see that all these numbers are mutually co prime. So, if you divide m by m i, so you have factored out m i. So, therefore, this m i or capital m i has to be co prime with small m i. Right? So, now therefore, I can take m i inverse mod small m i because m i and small m i are mutually co prime. Right? So, therefore, I can compute y i in this fashion. Right? So, so, therefore, now you see that y i is equal to m i inverse mod of small m i. Okay? So, what I say is that, so, so therefore, so therefore m i y i will be equal to 1 if I take mod of m i. Okay? But if you take mod of m j, where j is not equal to i, then what is this corresponding value? It is actually equal to 0, because m j will divide m i. Do you understand this? That is, if I take m i y i and I take mod of m j, where j is not equal to i, then this value will be equal to 0, because m j will divide m i. Okay? So, what, what I say is that this is a, so as I told you, is a constructive uh, proof. Okay? So, therefore, what I am saying is that this, this solution will be equal to sigma a i m i y i. Okay. So, therefore, now you see that what I am multiplying is that I am multiplying with a i and I am multiplying with big m i and I am multiplying with, with y i. Okay. So, therefore, now you see that if you go back to the example, this was the corresponding uh, congruence value, m i was the corresponding thing when you divided m by small m i. So, in that case m was 15 and you have divided that with 5. So, you got 3. Okay, and what was the value of y i? It was 2, it was the inverse. right? So, similarly you can get the second term also. So, the next thing to be understood is that y it is true. Okay. So, this you can actually easily check because what, so therefore, first thing is that we will we will see that this really satisfies the original system of equation. Okay. So, you take this row and you take mod of some m i value. Okay. So, if you take mod of m i, then obviously you understand that only for i this value m i y i will go to 1 right so you will have only a i but for the other things that is for the other j values this will actually go to 0 so only a, this will result in a i okay so therefore if you take a mod of m i then the right hand side will be only reduced to a i right 
So therefore, what you can do is that you compute this rho mod m i. So rho mod m i will be equal to a i. Why? Now because m i y i is equal to 1 mod m i and m i y i equal to 0 mod m j when j is not equal to y. Okay? So therefore, the right hand side will only result in a i. So therefore, similarly you can see that the all the system of equations will get satisfied. Right? So therefore, for what you observe here is this that this mapping or which I call as a psi x or x x is actually an onto mapping which means that given any result that is given any corresponding congruence value, I am always able to find out an x value mod m which will satisfy this. Okay? So, which means that nothing is left out on the on the right hand side on the range part. Okay? So, therefore, the next thing to be argued is that this function is actually a bijective function. Therefore, we are actually trying to show is that this is a unique mapping. Okay? So, since the domain and range have got the same cardinality, this becomes quite clear because we showed that the domain and range has got the same cardinality and on the right hand side this is, and this is also an onto mapping. So, therefore, if you combine these two things, it becomes a bijective mapping. Okay? So, that means that the solution is actually unique modulo m. Okay? So, that means that you not only get a solution, but this solution is actually only one and only one. Okay? Is this clear? Hmm? Example, I gave you an example just now. Uh, I gave you just now this example. Na, this. Uh, so, what I am interested in to compute is this x equal to 3 mod 5 and x equal to 1 mod 3. Okay? So, I am interested in computing this mod 15. Okay? So, what I do is that I take m, so if I take 5 and I take 3 and I multiply them, I get 15. Okay? So, then what I do is that I take 15 and I divide with the first m i value, so that is 3 okay? and then I take 3 inverse mod of 5. So, 3 inverse mod of 5 will be 2. Okay? So, similarly I take 15 divide by 3 I get 5 and I take the inverse of 5 it is 2. So, therefore, x you can actually write in this fashion. So, this is that sigma thing which you saw. Na? So, this if you open up the sigma you get this that 3 into 3 into 2 plus 1 into 5 into 2 it works out to 28 and mod 15 equal to 13 you can check this. So, therefore, this 13 you can see will satisfy the system of equation because if you take mod 5 it is 3, if you take mod 3 it is 1. Okay? So, therefore, 13 satisfies this simultaneous equations, congruences actually. Hmm. Cardinality becomes equal from here na? because you see that your input size is actually equal to what? Yeah, I mean there are 15 values in this case in the, in the, do, in the domain part. In the range part also you are uh, you are storing them as these numbers can uh, vary from what? From mod 5 and mod 3. Na? So, the first first f the first ordinate will actually vary from 0 to 4. There are 5 values. In the second case also there are 3 values. So, how many possibilities are there? There are also 15 values. So, in the domain and in the range there are I mean both of them have got the same cardinality. Okay? And at the same time you also showed that it is on to. Okay? So, therefore, it is a bijective method. Okay, so, what I am saying is like this that is suppose I am giving you some solution here like this where these are co prime and all these things. So, they are actually from there you can at least find out one x value for which this is getting satisfied. right? So, that means in the right hand side I mean you can note that this is like a function. Okay? So, therefore, you see that if I give you some value in the right hand side, okay, in the left hand side you are always getting one value. right? It is not that you are not getting some value. From this function, you will definitely get at least one value. Okay? And since the number is same in both the cases, there has to be a, it is a bijective mapping. Okay? You can also actually formally prove this by pigeonhole principle also, but I am not going to that. Okay? So, okay, so, but this is quite straightforward actually. I hope you understand this, right? Okay, so, therefore, uh, we will now conclude with some more useful facts. Uh, so, which will be useful for our RSA understanding actually. Okay? So, suppose G is a multiplicative group, group of order n and G is belonging to G. So, G is, so assume that G is a multiplicative group okay, and has got order n. So, order n means that number of elements are actually n. Okay? So, then the order of G will actually divide n. So, what is small g's order? 
So, suppose there is a multiplicative group and say there is a G element which belongs to capital G, okay. then the order of G, okay, I call this as order of G is actually equal is the smallest number or smallest positive integer say m okay, for which g power m is equal to 1. Okay. And I am of course, uh, so this is the corresponding identity, I mean uni, I mean uni, unity element, okay. so therefore, identity element. Okay. So, therefore, uh, g to the power of m is equal to i or 1 and yeah, mod of m of course. Uh, so, what I am saying essentially is that the order of g will divide actually n. So, therefore, the order of g will actually divide the number of elements in the group g. Okay. So, this is actually O means this is the number of elements in number of elements in g. Okay. So, this I am not proving this is called Lagrange's theorem. Okay. So, we will just assume this. Okay. mod m one mod n sorry yeah, mod n. Yeah. so so therefore the two natural interesting corollaries are as follows if you take b which belongs to zn star okay so zn star is a multiplicative group that we know okay so therefore suppose the order of b is say d okay so therefore b to the power of d should be equal to 1 right and what is the order of the group Z n star, it is phi n, right? Phi n, we have seen what is a phi n. So, therefore, b to the power of phi n has to be equal to 1 mod n, because d will divide phi n and therefore, b to the power of phi n is also equal to 1, right? Yes. Okay. Similarly, if I mean from this it follows that if n is a prime number, then phi, phi p will actually be equal to p minus 1. So, b to the power of p minus 1 will be equal to equal to b. Okay. So, therefore, yeah. So, therefore, b to the power of p will be equal to b mod p. Okay. And uh, this is written in this form, I mean because uh, suppose there can be two cases. Okay. One, so we, here we have written b belongs to z p. Okay. So, first of all, assume, assume that b belongs to z p star. So, what does it mean? Whom does it exclude? Now, whom does it, p is a prime number. Okay. So, all elements are co-prime, but if I say b belongs to z p star and I th and then that means that from b belongs to z p, which element am I excluding? 0. I am excluding 0. In z p actually 0 is there, but in z p star 0 is not there. right? So, here you see that 0 will satisfy this equation trivially. right? So, therefore, what we need to show is only that when b belongs to z p star. right? And if b belongs to z p star, then the previous result holds. So, b to the power of phi p. So, b to the power of phi p means what? b to the power of p minus 1. So, in that case also this holds. So, therefore, this holds for b belongs to z p. Okay? That is why it is written like this b to the power of p is actually equal to b mod p. Okay? But if I had written b to the power of p minus 1 equal to 1, then b would have belonged to z p star. I could have written b belongs to z p. Okay? Okay, so therefore, uh, so therefore, uh, so, so we have seen what is a cyclic group. So you see that if p is a prime, then z p star is the group of order p minus one, and any element in z p star which has an order has an order which will divide p minus one. Okay, so in fact, if p is prime, then there exists at least one element in z p star which has got an order equal to p minus one. So what does it mean? That if you take that particular element and if you keep on multiplying then the smallest number for which it will repeat or it will give you 1 is actually p minus 1. Okay? So, there is at least one element whose order is actually equal to p minus 1 and therefore, it is called a cyclic group because if you take this element, then it will generate all the elements in that field okay? and finally, it will come back to itself. Right? So, therefore, it is called a cyclic group and this element is sometimes called a primitive element. Okay? So, we have, if you remember that cycle that we draw in context to AES, you take an element if you keep on multiplying like alpha, alpha square, alpha cube, alpha to the power of 4 and so on, then finally, you get alpha to the power of p minus 1, it will be equal to 1 okay? and in p minus 1 is the smallest number for which that happens. So, that means this alpha if you multiply, it will generate all the elements in that field right? 
and therefore the name called cyclic group. Okay. So therefore, a primitive element is defined like this: if p is prime, then Z p star is a cyclic group. Okay, and any element, any element alpha having order p minus one mod p is called a primitive element. Okay, so thus alpha is a primitive element if and only if if you take alpha to the power of i and from zero to p minus two, you get actually the entire Z p star. So therefore, you can use alpha and compute the corresponding powers. And finally, you get the entire Z p star. So therefore, alpha generates the entire group. Okay. So alpha is called the primitive element. Okay. So you see that this is an example to clear that. So you take alpha here. Okay, and alpha is equal to uh, two. Okay, uh, and you keep on computing the powers. So therefore, here your n value is nineteen. So I am taking mod. Mod 19, so it means I am computing alpha, alpha squared, alpha power 3, alpha power 4, and so on till alpha power 18. So you see, the alpha power 18 is equal to 1. So that means now you see that all the elements which are there in Z n star is actually generated here. Okay, so that means what? This alpha is a primitive element because it is generating the entire group. Okay, so you see that there are some elements for which the Order is not actually equal to p minus one, but smaller than p minus one. But in this case, you will find that there are exactly six primitive elements. Why? Because this is one primitive element, this is one primitive element, this is one primitive element, this is another primitive element, this is another primitive element, this is another primitive element. So how many primitive elements do you have? There are six primitive elements. Okay. So can I justify why there are exactly six when n is equal to nineteen? Okay. So we will try to see all these things. So therefore, note that the order of Each element, so you can note that the order of each element in Z19 star, and you will find that it will divide. The I mean, each order which you take here will actually divide. Divide what? 19 or 19 minus 1? 19 minus 1, right? So therefore, each order will actually divide 19 minus 1, and primitive element will have the largest order. So the order of primitive element is actually equal to 18, right? So therefore, you see that. Do you understand why it's a cyclic group? Because you take this, it will go, go back to one. Means after that, if you multiply, it will come back to this, right? So it will continue like this. Actually, all the elements are cyclic groups. So if you take this, so therefore you take 4, 16, 7, 9, 17, 11, 16, 5, 1. Again, it comes back to four, right? So you see that all of them are forming cyclic groups, but only the largest. If you take a primitive element, then it forms the entire multiplicative group. Okay. So actually, you can show that any element b in Z p star, where p is a prime, can be written uniquely in the form of beta equal to alpha to the power of i. So this follows straight from the definition of primitive element, right? Where alpha is a primitive element and i li lies between zero and p minus two. The order of beta, so where beta is equal to alpha to the power of i. Is actually equal to p minus one divided by GCD of p minus one comma i, okay? And beta is itself primitive if and only if GCD of p minus one and i is equal to one, okay? So now can you say how many how many primitive elements will be there? Yeah. What? Well, you, you said something. Phi of p minus one. Okay. So if you take in this case nineteen, so therefore number of primitive elements will be phi of eighteen. So what is phi of eighteen? So what is eighteen? Eighteen I can write as three square into two. So what is phi eighteen? Phi of eighteen is six. Okay. I hope you remember that eighteen into one minus one by three, and similarly you can write that. So this will compute to six. So therefore, that is the reason why you had. Exactly six primitive elements. Okay, so now why is the order of beta equal to p minus one? Also, we can justify. I think a little bit like this. That is, order of beta is equal to p minus one divided by GCD of p minus one comma i. Okay, so I'll try to give you a simple proof for this. That is, if you take say beta equal to alpha to the power of i and let the or order of this element be say k, where k is some positive integer. Okay, so that means what? That beta to the power of k. Should be equal to one mod of p 
right. So, this one I could have written as some alpha to the power of some t into k minus 1, uh, t into p minus 1 mod p, where alpha is the corresponding primitive element, right, because alpha to the power of p minus 1 is what, 1, right, so therefore this is 1. So, what about the left hand side, it is beta to the power of k, so therefore that is alpha to the power of i k is equal to alpha to the power of t p minus 1. So, from here I can actually write that i of k equal to t of p minus 1, right. And therefore, k is equal to p minus 1 divided by i by k, right. So, now certain things becomes important, I mean observable from here that first of all, i of k has to divide p minus 1 because otherwise k is not an integer. Oh, sorry, i by t, yeah. So, i by t, so i by i by t has to divide p minus 1, right. So, i by t has to divide p minus 1. And what is the other thing that you observe from here? That i by t has to be a factor of i also, right. So, i by t is also a factor of i, right. So, therefore, now if I also, I mean if I, since the order is actually the least such number, so therefore it has to be corresponding to the, this denominator has to correspond to the greatest common divisor of p minus 1 and i. Okay, because the order is the least such number, right. So, therefore, it actually equal to p minus 1 divided by greatest common divisor of p minus 1 and i. Okay. <coughs> so, this you can prove in any other ways also. So, this is just one, so one sample. So. so, you see that p equal to 13, phi of 13 minus 1 equal to phi of 12, and that is actually equal to 4 of 6. Oh, this is this is a different example I think okay so p equal to the p equal to 13 okay p equal to 13 phi of 13 minus 1 equal to phi of 12 this works out to 4 so uh, what does it show it shows that in if you take p equal to 13 then there are four primitive elements okay so the question now which I will ask you is that is to a primitive element for z 13 star so what you will do the first thing that we can do is that we will generate all the p minus 1 powers of 2 and check that whether it is equal to 1 so this is quite a lengthy process okay so, actually luckily we have this theorem which gives you a easy check for the primality, okay. Uh, so, uh, for the primitiveness, it says that suppose that p is greater than 2 is prime and alpha belongs to z p star, then alpha is a primitive element modulo p if and only if alpha to the power of p minus 1 divided by q is actually not equal to 1 mod p for all primes q such that q divides p minus 1, okay. So, how can I prove this result? So, you see that one part is quite clear because if alpha is actually a primitive element, then obviously p minus 1 by q being smaller than p minus 1, this can never be equal to 1, because in that case alpha is not a primitive element, right. The other thing that needs to be proved is that, if alpha to the power of p minus 1 by q is not equal to 1 for all such primes, then alpha is a primitive element, right, right. So, therefore, the contrapositive of this would be what, that if alpha is not a primitive element, then there exists a q which divides p minus 1 such that alpha to the power of p minus 1 by q is equal to 1, right, that is a contrapositive. So, we will prove this. So, therefore, we will say that alpha is actually a not, I mean alpha is not a primitive element, okay. So, alpha is not a primitive element, okay. So, which means that there exists an alpha power d which is equal to 1 mod p and what d is actually smaller than p minus 1, okay. So, we know that d divides p minus 1, right. Therefore, p minus 1 by d is actually an integer value, right. So, therefore, let q be a prime number which divides p minus 1 by d, okay. So, you see that the moment I am saying that let q be a prime number, so that means that basically what I am saying is that there exists a q for which this is true, okay. So, therefore, q divides p minus 1 by d, so therefore, q divides p minus 1 by d. So, therefore, this implies 
that d also divides p minus 1 by q. Okay. So, now since alpha to the power of d is equal to 1 mod p, this implies that alpha to the power of p minus 1 by q is also equal to 1 mod p. Okay. So, therefore, this proves the result. Okay. Do you follow the proof? So, that concludes this particular uh, lesson. So, we have followed from Stinson and also portions from William Stallings cryptography and network security and next day we will continue with the RSA crypto system. Okay.